of your musical education, your background, music theory and, and sight reading and everything, how much of that help you? Let, let me rephrase that. Without that, would you have been able to do, to be the music director for you that? Know, I, I, you get asked that question all the time. People say, how important is theory? How important is knowing that stuff? Um, and I, when I didn't really pay as much attention to it when I was much younger, like 12, 13, I was an ear player. I had learned everything just kind of, you know, off the seat of my pants. And, and um, by the time I was 18 and I was really starting to get into jazz, I decided it was time to go back to school and learn the theory. So I, I think it's very important. It's just one more tool that you have um, that you can utilize in different situations. It helps speed the process along in so many different you know, situations that you're in, in communication. And uh, when I took that job, that's part of it. I had to look at the scores and I had to understand what the orchestrations were ahead of time so that uh, Tommy and I could approve them and see if they were, if they were some, up to our standards. Um, and uh, I use it quite a bit still, uh, my music training, my education and theory, because it, um, it, it, it just, I, I chart and score music often for people. Uh, again, one of the things I would probably give advice to younger musicians is that being good at several things is very important to making money in this several business. Things, several instruments or several? Just, just, I mean, if you can score stuff for people, if you can chart, if you can play um, multiple instruments, um, if you become a producer, you singing, obviously speak singing. Composing, yeah, yeah. Comp yeah. And if and if you're a producer, you can speak the language that mm -hmm. maybe a lot of musicians understand. Mm -hmm. You can get your point across more concisely. So, engineering, engineering, um, engineering is important. I, yeah. I because you can rely on other people to get the sound that you're hearing in your head, or you can go get it yourself. Yeah. No, I mean I, I, absolutely, especially nowadays when artists are 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 expected to actually create an album on their own and then bring it to a label or many labels to see which one is it has you know gives you the best option right right you exactly. know so you wind up being the producer and the engineer most cases and of course the uh, the uh, the songwriter and artist relation because you have to pick the songs Absolutely. that are going to be on the record and yeah. the, and the composer and everything yeah it's not like in the old days where you were just expected to basically write some songs and then they will pair you with the artist relation that would take a look at the songs and say, well, we need a couple of singles. Let's bring in an outside writer. Right. You have to make those decisions on your own now. You do now. Yeah. Absolutely. And then once once you get the producer, then the producer works on the uh, on the arrangement of the song. Right. You know, and then, you know, the promo guy has to set, uh, you know, goes out there and takes it to the record companies. Now you're expected to do that everything, every step of the way, even after the record's release, you're going to work it. You're going to tour it. Yep. You're going to get on social media. You gotta do everything. You're you're busier than you've ever been, for yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly, know? exactly. And you know what? I, because you know, you you and I we've we've been through it. You know, we we both entered the social media age at the same time. And I recall that I used to have more time to practice, but then again, I had less time to learn because I didn't have YouTube on the road, which is what I use all every single day. Right. You know, as as a source of learning music. Yeah. I had the time, but I didn't have the resources. Right. Now I have less time, but I got more resources. Got less time because I'm more time on social media, you know, talking about uh, the gig that we did last night and being, you know, yeah. talking to the fans and, and, you know, doing silly stuff. And then, but uh, how much, how important is time management? That's, how do you deal with that every single day? It, it And like you said, it becomes a very, it's a big struggle because you have now so many things that are either distracting you or you're distracting yourself with and you are managing a lot of things especially with the social media um, platform and it is important to obviously promote yourself and what you're doing um, but I think it's prioritizing right it's figuring out what the most important thing is to do for that day and, and you're like me you like to bring your instrument to your room and one number one thing is the show tonight. So the first thing I need to do is make sure that I'm going to play my parts as accurately as possible, mm -hmm. and so I don't have to think about it up there, and I can just be free to be musical. Yeah. And and so that's 
I know it's probably the same for you. It's priority mm-hmm. one over social media or anything else, you know, yes, yes. That, and, and so that, and, um, and then figuring out what the next thing is, right. Doing your uh, scheduling management, which is what's coming up in the next couple of weeks. What, what, you know, how do I arrange my time so that I can maximize, um, whatever music is going to come my way in my schedule, uh, opportunities, new relationships, that sort of thing. Um, but like you said, it becomes, it's a, it's a beast, right? It is a beast. It is a beast. And, and especially now since you moved to Nashville, yeah, I, I would say, I mean, I've been there and I know it's a, it's the most musical town. In the world right now, yeah. uh, you, you, I mean, if you throw a rock in any direction, you're going to hit a couple of musicians. Amazing musicians. Yeah, amazing like, musicians. Those guys are scary. I know. I, know. Yeah. I mean, how do you like, living? Do you get calls from people saying, "Hey, I'm I, come on down. I, you know, let's write some music or help me produce this." Or right, right. Well, you know, I'm new. To, I'm new to Nashville for the last year or so, or I, I moved there about a year ago. And um, yes, it's still very much a pop country town. Um, but there's more rock than there ever has been there, and the rock influence is kind of coming in. Lots of people from Los Angeles are moving into Nashville, and um, but it's you know it's still growing in that in that capacity. So I'm still told occasionally when I'm producing or working out a project that I'm a rock guy. You're the rock guy. You know you moved in from California, and there's a couple projects I have you in mind for or this or that, but it. Still very much a pop country, you know, town to, to what I've seen so far. But um, I do I do work with a lot of different people and I've made good friends with some of the, the studios there and uh, particularly Blackbird, which I love. I love uh, I love that studio that John McBride has there and um, like working out of there when I can. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's just, you know, forging new relationships when you move to a new mm-hmm. city. It's it's mm-hmm. always it's always yeah. a little bit of a challenge at first. It's a but. wonderful place. A few years ago, I got to record at the kitchen sink. Mm-hmm. I did a record there, and I got to play with some uh, local heavyweights. Right, you know, and it was just fantastic. You know, yeah. I love. I just love that. I and mean, people were dropping by all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it was like wow. It's like the old days, and you know, back in, in the seventies at the record plant or Cherokee, where you know you're recording, and just, all these people start dropping by. You know, it's, it's fantastic. True. It's it's got a really great sense of community. That's what I love about Nashville. Everyone's really friendly. Mm. Um, there's a sense of community, and um, people are trying to help each other. It's not yes. as cutthroat as some of the other places that yeah. you know. I know absolutely. Uh, how did you wind up in the Guess Who? Um, well, because of my relationship with Tommy Shaw, um, Tommy is also good friends with Sash Jordan and Derek Sharp. Derek being the singer, guitar player, of the Guess Who. Sass being his wife, who has an outstanding career uh, herself in her own right. And they are friends with Tommy, and something came through the grapevine where uh, the guitarist was leaving the Guess Who, and uh, Derek was looking for someone to replace him and, and had asked Tommy what he thought you know would be the best recommendation, and Tommy threw my name in the hat. And uh, that's how that connection was made, and uh, it's been about... Wow, it's four or five years now. Like, wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So and was there like an audition period or it was pretty much like, oh, you know, they were familiar with your work or was it just Tommy's word and say, hey, this is the guy for you and, and, and that was good enough? He gave a great endorsement, which I'm thankful for. Um, and you know this as well. Sometimes people, are, they just needed someone to cover the gig at first, right? And that's always how it goes. Like, you know, mm-hmm. come in and if this works out, great. But it was literally five days, and you learn the book, and you fly in, and maybe you get a little bit of a sound check to run through a couple songs, and yeah. then you go. You know, that's that's yeah. how this goes a lot of times. Yeah. And uh, the first gig went great, but, you know, there's no, if the fit's wrong, regardless mm. of who you are, mm. if the fit's wrong, everybody oh, yeah, kind of knows it. So after a few shows like that, it mm. just kind of, it, it just kind of gelled, and, yeah. uh, and they offered me the job officially about a week yeah. or a week and a half later. So yeah, when when I was asked actually just to come in for a few shows, yeah, like, like you mentioned, you know, I started work, working on on the on the on the book on the catalog, yeah, and it just hit me that every single song I knew from growing up, it was the soundtrack of my life. So, so you know, it, sometimes you play in bands 
especially if you've been like the one of the founding members or somebody close to that level, you know, beginning stages of the band, that along the way certain music becomes painful. Yeah. To play. Yeah. It, because certain things happen within the band, you know, we, we either had tragedy or conflicts and you move on or whatever. But for me in a situation like the Guess Who, uh, it was all joyful. Yeah. Because even though, you know, I'll be playing something like like these eyes and a memory of a crazy girlfriend from high school pops out. <laughs> you know? Hopefully not too crazy. And I just laugh. I smile because I, I'm in a better place now than when we broke up back then. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, every song is, is, is very... It, it, it's a joy to play because I really don't have an emotional connection of any tragedy or any conflicts with it. To me, it's just purely the soundtrack of my life. Yeah. How, how does that feel for you? Is it, is it about the same? It is. I mean, in the sense that I was talking about my brother earlier and his record collection, and but my father was also really into great music, and it could be anything from Cat Stevens to Stevie Wonder to The Guess Who or Chicago or you name it. And that stuff, I listened to a lot of 60s and 70s music as a very young kid. And so I guess who was like, are you kidding me? I, I love that catalog. I mean, that's kind of where I live anyway. I love 70s music a mm, lot. Yeah. Um, the vibe of it, The um, we talk about this all the time, yeah. how musical it is, how... You know, it it, it, it it things got a lot more concise and simpler in the eighties, not in a bad way, but just really produced in in in, in some ways, rock music. And um, and then you because we were talking about bass lines and how melodic they were in the seventies as opposed to the more produced versions of, of bass, which was a lot of eighth notes and eighth quarters notes, yeah, and yeah, yeah right, yeah. right. Dun, 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 yeah. But you know, of, it yeah. just was a very musical era and the guess who is is a testimony to that. You know, Absolutely. All the catalog is just it's just very musical. The guess who it's just it, it's everything I love about seventies rock music and those songs are anthemic and like you said, they are a soundtrack to your life. I mean they probably bring you back so many memories of of growing up and that song meant this and this song meant that and so I, I yeah I, I I was very excited to get that phone call. You guys started. I say you guys because the record, the new record that's coming on in September, the new Guess Who record is uh -huh. coming on in September. Uh, the future is what it used to be yeah. on Cleopatra. Uh, that was started before I was even a glimmer <laughs> in the horizon of, of the band. You guys started on the record before I actually got to play with you guys. Yeah. Um, I mean, at least the songwriting yeah, process we, of it. Yeah, we've been kind of formulating the songs for that for a couple of years whenever mm -hmm. um, Derek and I would just share ideas back and forth and then we on a, on a handful of occasions we premeditated getting Leonard Shaw and Derek, who's the uh, keyboardist, um, flautist of the band singer and he he three of us we got together and we wrote some songs together as mm -hmm. well for it um, and I think kind of the mantra of it was let's do something in the spirit of what you know the guess who's their their the lineage um, of music is you know so it, it needs to kind of stay classic and be just great anthemic songs with big background harmony stacks and and so that was the, that was the uh, mission statement for that for the record that we just uh, wrote, and um, serendipitously you've come along and we got you, we got you to play on a few of the tracks. Mm -hmm. and so that's that's how that worked. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, there's I'm glad a... that it didn't finish the process before you mm -hmm. came into the band because yeah, we were too. able to get your. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, you know it was really yeah. just a joy to work with you. Yeah, you, you and too. I did. You too. Uh, you're you're a great producer, uh, really are. Yeah, I'm, really enjoyed it. Um, we have uh, Jim Kale, the original founding member of the band Bassist. Yeah, who I actually took over. Um, he plays on the record. He does. And, and Michael Devon was actually filling in. Yes, My, before uh, I joined the band officially. Jim's on a couple of tracks, mm -hmm. and then Michael did mm -hmm. the Blackbird sessions mm -hmm. with Gary. When Gary laid all the bed tracks, all the drum tracks um, at Blackbird, Michael um, graciously came in. I think he had just gotten off the road with Whitesnake, mm -hmm. um, and 
I, I think he had like no sleep. I mean, he was, I think he was doing it with <laughs> Japan or he was in South, South America. So yeah. he was, I mean, I was, I was a shock that he was able to keep his eyes open. Uh, he had done like a tw- 